Hello, everyone, um, and welcome to the Brooklyn Rails Common Ground. I'm Anya, the events assistant here at the Rail, and I have the pleasure and the privilege of being your MC today for a conversation featuring Hala Liza Gafori, Sarah Elton Tawi, Oiku Tekton, and Leonard Schwartz. We will open and close with a reading from Hala of her new English translations of Rumi's Gold. Before we get started, the Brooklyn Rail acknowledges that Black Lives Matter and that here in New York, we are on Lenapehoking, the unceded land and waters of the Wappinger, Canarsie, Munsee, and Lenape Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and Shinnecock Indian Nation. We encourage you to check the chat for a living document of resources and actions, which I will post shortly. Over the past 22 years, the Brooklyn Rail has undertaken a miraculous journey, bringing together in a single monthly publication art, music, dance, film, theater, and literature, along with thoughtful social and political meditations. As a small nonprofit, we need your support. Your contribution will directly support our writers, guest artists, production staff, and operations here at The Rail. Please check the chat for more information and links to donate. And now to introduce today's host, Leonard Schwartz is the author of numerous books of poetry, including most recently, Heavy Sublimation and Salamander, a bestiary with painter Simon Carr. Schwartz hosted the radio program, Cross-Cultural Poetics, archived online at the University of Pennsylvania's Penn Sound. Uh, so without further ado, please, Leonard, take it away. Okay, Anya, thank you so much. Um, great to see you all here and to see so many fine poets and writers uh, that I just, at a quick glance, can see just, just entered. And maybe I'll introduce, make some introductions of people who are here for this event a, a little bit later on. First, I want to introduce um, our three guests. Um, uh, of course, first is Hala Liza Gafori. Uh, she's just come out with these new translations of Rumi. Uh, the book is entitled Gold. It's published by New York Review Books. Um, about the book, I uh, have it here in my hand. Kaba Akbar writes, rich in idiom and spirit, Gafori's Rumi teaches me how to wander into mystery, humble as soil, without galloping towards a hasty, inorganic conclusion. Um, Ahala herself, of course, is a translator, but also a vocalist and a poet and an educator born in New York City of Persian descent. Uh, she's uh, an accomplished performer in all of those respects, and so it's really exciting to have her Rumi with us this week. Uh, as respondents to the Rumi translations, we have two uh, uh, two other guests. One is Sarah Eltantawi. She's a scholar and professor of theology at Fordham University, specialist in contemporary Islam and Islamic law. Um, and she uh, is the author of a wonderful book called uh, Sharia on Trial, the Northern Nigeria's Islamic Revolution. That's from University of California Press. A uh, former teaching colleague of mine and a wonderful friend. Great to have you here, uh, Sarah El Tantawi. And then uh, we'll also be hearing, uh, importantly, from Oyu Tekton, poet, translator, editor, founding member of Pin, uh, Pinsapo, an art and publishing experience with a particular focus on work in and about translation, contributing editor and archivist with Lost and Found, the CUNY Poetics Documents Initiative. And I've asked her if she can speak to us a little bit about Rumi in the Turkish tradition, uh, Turkish language tradition. So um, without anything further, so I think what we have in mind is to ask uh, Liza Gafori if she'll take us into Rumi's Gold, uh, and then we'll hear responses from Sarah Elton Tawe and Oyoko Tekten. I might have a question for each of those uh, three speakers, and then we'll open it up for conversation, question and answer conversation from, from everyone who's present. So uh, please, Hala, please welcome Hala Liza Gafori. Thank you, Leonard. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Brooklyn Rail. Thanks, everybody, for being here today. Let's start with this poem. Oftentimes, when he's speaking in the you in the second person, he's often speaking to Shams, his beloved mentor. Your laughter turns the world to paradise. It tears through me like fire. It teaches me. Reborn in emptiness. I emerge laughing. 
here to learn from love, new depths of laughter. I've been short on courage, but I have a heart of sunlight straight from the king's hand. I stir up laughter even in those who fear joy. Crack open my shell, steal the pearl, I'll still be laughing. It's the rookies who laugh only when they win. Last night, the spirit of dawn came to my room and gave me a lesson in laughter. Our blazing roars lit the morning sky. When I brood like a rain cloud, laughter flashes through me. It's the habit of lightning to laugh through a storm. Look at the furnace, look at the stones, see the glowing red veins, gold laughing in fire, daring you. Prove you're no fake, laugh even when you lose. We're fodder for death, so learn to laugh from the angel of death. He laughs at the jeweled belts and crowns of kings, all that splendor is just on loan. Treetop, treetop blossoms erupt in laughter, petals rain down, laugh like the bud of a flower hugging the ground. Its hidden smile opens to a laugh that lasts a lifetime. Let's love each other. Let's cherish each other, my friend, before we lose each other. You'll long for me when I'm gone. You'll make a truce with me. So why put me on trial while I'm alive? Why adore the dead, but battle the living? You'll kiss the headstone of my grave. Look, I'm lying here still as a corpse, dead as a stone. Kiss my face instead. We exited the battleground and crooked valley of thorns. We shed our twisted delusions and from a heart-rending world of deception broke free. Greed stripped everyone bare. We knew its tricks, had played them ourselves. We broke into the store of greed and burned it to the ground. Ocean waves roared at our heels. We escaped just in time and lay down to rest in a garden where good luck seeds the soil. We ride without horses. We soar without wine. No need for a jug or cup and no debts to the wine cellar. We had spun round and round, making and breaking promises again and again. Under the eyelash of a new moon, we leapt off that wheel and landed on our feet. We practiced for 40 days again and again. We reached new depths of love. We realized the one we seek is always where we are. We listened in silence. Love speaks in silence, not in the rote words of schools or the cries of the marketplace. Gold gathers in silence. No more words. Rising sun, you release us from the guards, the thieves, the knights within us and without. Rumi has a lot to say about thinking. In one couplet, he says, Pam bevas vas birun kon ze gush, ta as gushat ayad as gardun khurush. Vas vas is one, this one little word in Persian means doom ridden thinking. So he says, take the cotton of the mind's doom ridden chatter out of your ears. Hear the booming voice of the heavens. Hear the roar of fate. Hear the ruckus the muse makes. And he says he was no stranger 
to overthinking previous to Shams. He says, for 40 years, my mind drowned me in thought. When love hooked me like a fish, I leapt out of my mind. See how the fruit is trapped, first by its seed, then by its husk. See how I was trapped, first by circumspection, then by calculation. Like a fig split open, my seeds are bare. Our first meal on earth begins with blood and ends with milk. When my mind grew teeth, I craved more than milk. I chased my daily bread with a net, a mask, a bag of tricks. When the soul of souls caught me, nourished me, I shed my trickster skin. Silence, no more details. I had enough of my own fever. I leapt free. You leading the caravan, look at your camels, head to tail, all of them drunk. The king is drunk, the captain is drunk, friends and strangers, they're all drunk. Gardener, listen, thunder beats a drum, clouds pour the wine. The garden is drunk, the meadow is drunk, the buds and thorns are drunk. Whirling sky, watch how the elements whirl. Water is drunk, air is drunk, earth is drunk, fire is drunk. Don't even ask about the unseen. Spirit is drunk, intellect is drunk, imagination is drunk, and the mysteries of eternity, they're the drunkest of all. Liberate yourself from the tyranny of self. Be humble as soil and you will see every particle of soil is drunk on love by the creator's design. In winter, the garden is still drunk. The roots of trees secretly sip wine. You have a jug of love's wine. Pour for all in equal measure. There's been enough brawling. Friends, enemies, admit it or deny it. They're all drunk, all whirling at the core. Keep pouring. Loosen the knots, only a head steeped in the wine of love will tear off the turban and crown. Pour the reddest wine for the ill and ailing. Let their sallow faces flush with fire. Let them burn with love. God's wine is light and delicate. You can drink countless jugs. Shams of Tabriz, in your presence, no one is sober. Infidel and believer, ascetic and winemaker, they're all. A lion leaps out of his cage, a man leaps out of his mind. Bravery is delicious madness, not some circumspect, cagey thought, sly and ungiving. Why scheme for a morsel? Curb your insatiable hunger, and you won't be seduced by a trickster or reduced to being one. When greed groans, I act deaf. He says, why paint night over nightless day? Every religion has love, but love has no religion. Love is an ocean, no borders, no shores. Drown there and you won't lament it. The drowned have no regrets. He says, ای خردم شکار تو تیر زدن شعار تو شست دلم به دست کن جان مرا نشان مکن 
آب حیات عشق را در ما روان کن روان کن روان کن He says let love the water of life flow through our veins let a love drunk mirror steeped in the wine of dawn translate night you who pour the wine put the cup of oneness in my hand and let me drink from it until i can't imagine separation love you are the archer my mind is your prey Carry my heart and make my existence your bullseye. Unless love dyes you in its colors, your driftwood in God's eye, your stone, Love unleashes water from every rock. Love clears the rust from every mirror. Blasphemy, faith, war, peace. Love sets fire to all of them. In the ocean of the heart, love opens its mouth like a well and swallows the divided world whole. Love is a lion, pure and simple. Not a fox one moment and a leopard another. I love the ways like, you know, it's a whale, then it's a, it's a fox. It's not, like, you know, we're moving around between through the animal kingdom, many incarnations of love. You know, love is the ocean, love is fire. Okay. In the ocean of the heart, love opens its mouth like a whale and swallows the divided world whole. Love is a lion. Pure and simple. It's not a fox one moment and a leopard another. Love nourishes and mends. Love opens the clenched body, lets the soul breathe. Reason is baffled and spirit too dazzled to reason. Divine wind, my heart is in Tabriz. Send my message of servitude right away. Lovers, why fear disgrace? Why should you feel ashamed? Love is your unshakable kingdom. Love is your throne, your home. A leopard devoured by love doesn't fear the world, its scents or colors. A whale hollowed out by love's flames doesn't fear hell's waters. Love's wine makes the cup forget it's a cup. What will it do to a lover? Pour some in a volcano's mouth. Will it quit oozing fire? Will it quit shooting stones? You with a heart of glass, learn from love's sturdy cup. If your soul is a trapped bird, how will you fall in love's trap? Like the drop, like a drop of mercury, like a excuse me, like a drop of mercury in the palm of a hand, you wobble. Hold steady. No need for me to speak of the sea's transparency when you can see clear to the bottom. Grim and somber, feeling guilt for simple pleasures. Joy is not a sin. If you've made a habit of drinking vinegar. Don't blame the vine. Ditch the vinegar and ditch the vendor who doesn't deal in life's nectar. Pour love's wine and quit peddling misery. Look at me at this feast. I'm the lowest of the low. I'm so far gone and I can't tell up from down. 
one of my, it's a, it's a passage I like very much. Um, if you've made a habit of drinking vinegar, don't blame the vine. Ditch the vinegar and ditch the vendor who doesn't deal in life's nectar. Pour love's wine and quit peddling misery. Look at me. <laughs> at this feast, I'm the lowest of the low. I'm so far gone in ecstasy. I can't tell up from down. And that sort of willingness, you know, brings us back to the first poem I read when he says, uh, crack open my shell, steal the pearl, I'll still be laughing. It's the rookies who laugh only when they win. The haman is the word, ham means raw. And, um, and uh, you know, he, he sums up his life as I was raw, I was cooked, I was burned up, right? And burning up in his philosophy is a wonderful thing. You know, um, he, when, when Shams is challenging him, he says to Shams, Shams says, you're an idol, you're a candle in the middle, middle of a gathering, you're an idol to your fans, you're a candle in the midst of a gathering, because of course he was very famous. And Rumi says, no, 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 I'm no idol, I'm the, and I'm no candle, I'm the scattering of smoke. So this sense of, you know, when he says, when I am, I am not. When I am not, I am. And he became, of course, the most idiosyncratic version of himself, a poet, when he was not. So it's funny, it's, a, it's you know, it's a, there's a, there's a paradox there, of course but he became liberated. Here's one where he talks a little of his struggles and we see the incredible humility. I saw myself sharp as a thorn. I fled to the softness of petals. I saw myself sour as vinegar. I mixed myself with sugar. An aching eye seeing through pain, a stewing pot of poison, I was both. Reaching for the antidote, I touched compassion. I touched mercy. I was a cup holding only the dregs. I poured in the water of life. Raw and callow, I followed the ones already cooked by love's fire. In the dirt on love's path, I found the medicine that ensouls sight. My armor thinned to a silken scrim. I sifted the soil that gives vision to the blind. My armor thinned to a silken scrim. I sifted the soil that gives vision to the blind. Love said, yes, you have arrived, but don't think it's your doing. I'm wind, you're fire, I stoke your flames. So after all that, you know, it's still love, love says, okay, buddy, but you know, don't get a big head about it. <laughs> you know, <laughs> this constant return to the soil, to the hawk, you know, when uh, Shams of Tabriz was, was hawky, hawky means of the soil, earthy. He was not in his silk robes wearing his crown turbans like so many um, sur surrounding Rumi. And this was for Rumi, this was a revelatory thing. This was a liberating thing to move out of hierarchical thinking and to continually come back to the soil. You know, he says, I'm not that lion battling an enemy. Confronting myself keeps me busy enough. I am the soil love seeds, roses and lilies bloom from this mud. I ached from separation. I cloaked myself in night, emerged a shining moon. Consumed in love's fire, I slip through any opening. I rise like smoke. I am a child. Love is my teacher, waking me from ignorance. Like love, I will live on, radiant, eternal, when eating and sleeping are done. 
Till then, like Bubak, the master musician, I quiet my mind and listen. I fast. In silence, we hear body become spirit. Um, I'll read one more. Is, what's the time? Is that the right time frame? Okay, one yeah. more. Read, read one more. That would be great. This one I read yesterday um, in yesterday's suggestion. I didn't read any of the, these that I just read yesterday, but this one I read yesterday. I'll read it again only because it just speaks to that energy that's marching across Europe right now or march. You're devastating. Oh, your voice, your, your voice, we can't hear you again. I don't know what happened, but I can't hear you. I see your lips moving, but I can't hear you. Mm. I hear, I heard that. Mm. Okay. I don't know why that keeps happening. Okay. You can hear me now. All right. So you heard me say this is, I'll, I read this poem. Okay. Here we yes, go. Yes, that we heard. You're ready for battle, eager for chaos and blood, but too terrified to breathe one breath in awe and reverence. Moment after moment, a new being is born, branching like a tree. Creation leaps from star to star, angels and demons marvel. While pumped up and plump, you fiddle with your mustache, you boast of your manhood and fancy yourself a lion, fierce and domineering. You're immersed in the unfathomable and you see nothing but yourself. Be amazed. Look how lucky the desert is. A clear sky above and emptiness below. Love travels end to end on every wind. Thank you, Hale, so much for, for taking us into, into gold. You know, yesterday I, I said uh, in our ecstatic embodiment uh, reading with Holly Melgard and, and yourself that when we met in 2018, you'd already been uh, working on these translations quite a bit. But every time I met you between 2018 and 2021, you were, of course, still working on it. There was a lot of hard work, but you, were ecstatic, you seemed to me to be ecstatic as if you were uh not just channeling Rumi in some rhetorical way but uh, really really medium mediumistically as a medium would uh channeling Rumi and uh I certainly felt that very strongly again today as, as you were reading so um we have uh some of the poems of uh of Halalaza Gafori's uh vision of Rumi in gold uh in our ears and I'm going to turn to Sarah El Tantawi for her comments and thoughts on Rumi and Sufi poetry. I'll say it was my great privilege to have team taught a class with uh, Sarah El Tantawi in her past, uh, her previous academic posting. Uh, that was a class on uh, languages of unsang. We looked at contemporary American poetry, poets who've been influenced by the Sufi tradition, uh, like Nathaniel Mackey and Joseph Donahue and Fanny Howe. Uh, and their background, of course, in the actual Sufi tradition, which has its background, of course, in Islam. So uh, with that a preface or introduction, please welcome Sarah El Tantawi. Thank you so much. This is a real honor to be here. And it's not every day that I am welcomed into the world of poets. So I am um, very, very happy to be here. and. Very sorry to inform you that my comments are going to be significantly less aesthetically pleasing than what you just heard. Um, I, I, what I'm going to concentrate on is one of the the major themes that myself and Leonard Schwartz focused on when we talked to, when we talked together, which was the the Islam aspect of Rumi, and so this question has become a central one since Rumi, I think it was maybe 10 years ago now that Rumi was declared the number one best-selling poet in the United States. Um, 
And even though that was the case, very few people really realized that Rumi was not just Muslim, but a Quran scholar and someone who actually took Islam theologically and legally very seriously. This then, this conversation then gained steam in 2017 when an important piece was published in the New Yorker called The Erasure of Islam from the Poetry of Rumi by Rosina Ali, um, which really raised the question more centrally about what it means that we in the West are not aware that Rumi is grounded in the Islamic tradition and what we do about that. So I want to briefly tackle this question from two angles. And my, my thesis here is twofold. Yes, it is true, number one, that Islam has been denunded from Rumi in the West. And there are reasons for that that we can look at. It's also true that Sufism has been, there has been an attempt to disaggregate Sufism from Islam in the Muslim majority world. And why is that? And my, my, my concern with the removal of Rumi from the tradition of Islam in the West, for me, mostly has to do with the fact that that gives aid and comfort to those in the Muslim majority world who also want to remove Sufism from the tradition of Islam. And so there's a tradition to look at there um, to help us understand why that's happening. So um, from the Western perspective, what we have seen is, and again, this is difficult because the way, so there's two main ways in which we see Islam removed from the understanding of Rumi in Western discourse. The first is uh, an attempt to understand Sufism, which is the mystical tradition of Islam, is an attempt to understand Sufism as the quote unquote good Islam. That's the safe Islam. That's the Islam that's not threatening. That's the one where Muslims are, or it's very rarely said Muslims, but that's those are the people talking, whirling and talking about wine and, and, and love, and those people are fine. And it's the other Muslims who are more political or have other things to say about world events that are the problem. And it's important to divide those two camps and keep them separate. Um, uh, when we talked together, um, I showed our students a, a report from a, I won't name it here, uh, an important US think tank that actually wrote a report very much saying this very explicitly that the Muslims that are the ones we wanna promote that we wanna do business with are the Sufis. And this will be a way of marginalizing pretty much everyone else. So that's one way that this gets expressed in Western discourse. Another way that it gets expressed is through this language of universalism. And here I think we get into tricky territory. So on one hand, there is an attempt to say that Rumi and Rumi's poetry is not in any way part of the Islamic tradition, um, or if it is, that's just a coincidence, it's incidental. From a poetic artistic point of view, what we need to know is that Rumi is channeling something that's universal for all of humanity and for all of mankind. And the fact that he happened to have been born into the Muslim majority world is, is a coincidence. Um, now, the problem with that analysis is that it's not strictly true in the sense that we know that Rumi was very much influenced by Islamic theology. And that's important for us to know. On the other hand, especially if you're a, a scholar of Sufism, you, you want to know these influences and you, you would find that of interest. But I will concede to the poets that, of course, this is universal, right? Uh, that there, there, is a univer there is such a thing as the universal, which I guess I'm in the rare minority of academics that acknowledge that. <laughs> but I do, it, I do think there's something called the universal. And I think that that uh, Rumi is tapping into that. I also think he may have self-consciously thought that he was tapping into that. And indeed, Islam itself as a tradition believes that it has a universal message. So that's a bit of a tension that we can come back to. Um, now, from the Muslim side, there has been an attempt in modernity to separate Islam from its mystical tradition. And there are several reasons why that is that I won't get into, 
But the facts are these, which is that Sufism itself, which is the mystical tradition of Islam, is about as old as Islam itself. Um, there, there are mystical aspects to all of the early um, Islamic stories. There have been what we call now is kind of anachronistically Sufi tafsir, which would be mystical interpretations of the Quran that are extremely old. Um, but Sufi orders did not emerge until about the 12th century. So a Sufi order is an organized group of Sufi adherents that form their own communities and develop their own what we call silsilas or chains of teachers. Um, and one of those teachers is Rumi. So there is something called the Mahnavi Sufi order. It's centered in Turkey and it has its chain that goes all the way back to Rumi. So it would be Rumi taught a teacher and the teacher, it, it's a particular um, traditional form of Islamic learning. So that actually exists as an order. And in the Muslim majority world, especially from the 18th century onward, for reasons that are a little too complex for me to get into here, there has definitely been a, cons but it happened beforehand too, there's certainly been a concerted effort to uh, separate the Sufi orders from orthodox legal Islam. And the reasons for this are, again, many, but that is not that has really accelerated, that trend has accelerated in modernity. But for most of Islamic history, the mystical tradition and the legal tradition have been considered two sides of the same coin and absolutely necessary to be an ideal Muslim. And in fact, there's a very famous saying, and I'll read it in Arabic first. It's, من تسوف ولم يتفقها فقد تفسق. That means he who is a mystic or a Sufi, but is does not adhere to Islamic law is an apostate. And he who adheres to Islamic law, but is not a Sufi has gone astray. So it has, it, it's, it's, been accepted in the and the interesting thing about this quote is that it's attributed to Malik, who is one of the founders of um, a very important Islamic legal school. So you can't get more kind of authoritative than that. Now I won't get too scholarly about this because it's actually pretty doubtful that he said this because Malik was alive before Sufi orders. But the point is you history has considered to be the proper approach to Islam, which theologically at the end of the day does have some kind of universal meaning as the attempt to discover the divine order. So you need both mysticism. Poets could, now uh, this is where I'm really glad I'm talking to so many poets because you're probably uniquely positioned to understand the, the specific type of misunderstanding and sometimes persecution that can come when you are a more metaphorical than literal thinker and and um, proclaimer. So for so think you know we have many instances in Islamic history where a Sufi would achieve uh, some kind of state of fana or annihilation or um, and you know we have a famous example of uh, Ibn Halaj spinning around in the in the square of Baghdad saying, I am God, I am God, I am God. Now, I could tell you that he doesn't mean that he is the creator of the universe. What he means is that he understands that the breath of life that has been breathed in, he's in touch with God, which is, which is the, point, the point of Sufi mysticism, which uses the metaphor of the polished mirror, is to polish your ego enough of your heart so that you realize that within you contains the breath of God. But the problem is the ego is a double-sided trickster. So once you realize that God is within you, the ever-present danger is that you're going to think that you are God, that you created that God. So this is why you need Islamic law to keep you in check, to keep you praying, to keep you fasting, to keep you doing remembrance so that you don't take that ego too far. 
Um, so for example, when you go into the square and you say, I am God, well, he, got, he was killed, right? Because that's considered shirk or idolatry and that's the worst possible sin. So, um, so this, you know, Islamic society has been full of people who did not understand metaphor and did not understand where the Sufis were really coming from on that. And so there has been a certain amount of persecution there, which has led to a situation today where those who do belong to Sufi orders across the Muslim majority world, of which there are, of course, many, many people, are careful to present in that balanced way between law and mysticism. And so within everything I just said, you know, one of the questions I would leave us with for contemplation is, what is the, the real role of the universal message here of poetry, of Sufism, of Rumi in particular? And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm certainly not asking Western-based poets to get involved in the struggle in the Muslim majority world to have the Muslims understand that Sufism is important. But I would just say from my point of view, that uh, when it, it when that separation persists in the West, it becomes easier for people in the Muslim majority world who, for various reasons, don't want to acknowledge the mystical heart of Islam to say, well, see, um, this is actually a Western product. Um, it's complicated, but I'm hoping to think that through with uh, my esteemed panelists and guests today a little bit more. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah, so much to, to think about there and talk about. When, when we taught together, we focused more on Ibn Arabi than on, than on Rumi. And in Ibn Arabi, you made it very clear how the Sufi mystical uh, practice is balanced against a, vol a huge body of work on the law, right, that Ibn Arabi also produced and that mysticism and the law are uh, in a kind of yin-yang tension with one another, properly speaking. So hopefully we can go into, into to more of that in, in just a little bit. Um, the next respondent is Oiku Tekton, um, uh, who, uh, you know, I, th I think of Rumi in some ways as the classical, classic liberal cosmopolitan. He was born in Afghanistan. He wrote in Farsi. He lived and died, and there's a, a tomb for him in Turkey. So, and the po in the poems, he goes into taverns and carouses with Christians and Jews and Zoroastrians and many others, and it's this kind of kind of a meeting of various kinds of minds. Uh, with that in mind, I was uh, hoping uh, Oiku could take us into Turkish traditions pertaining to Rumi. So, thank you so much for being here from Granada, Spain, no less. Um, thanks, Leonard, for putting these events together, and um, thanks, um, uh, Brooklyn Rail, for hosting us. Um, it's really wonderful to be part of this conversation that um, started yesterday, and thank you, Hale, uh, once again, for making Rumi sound like Rumi in English. Um, I already mentioned this, uh, but I will repeat myself that, you know, I've been waiting for these translations all my life without knowing it, so I really appreciate um, your translations. And before um, saying anything else, I would like to begin with a confession. Uh, Leonard, you just mentioned where, you know, Rumi was born, um, but, you know, I, up until maybe in my early 20s, I did not know that um, Rumi was born in Afghanistan um, and that he wrote in Farsi um, or that he didn't write a single line in Turkish. Um, and, um, Though, you know, even though I thought I knew him and his poetry well by then, um, but I came across this biographical information in an English um, source when I left Turkey. Um, and, you know, like since Rumi um, is very much part of the poetic, religious, um, and cultural fabric and imagination in Turkey, it still baffles me that it took me that long to find out um, Rumi's, you know, birthplace and, and the language he spoke or, or write in. But I'm not alone in this because, you know, there are still to this day um, common readers who um, think of Rumi as a Turkish uh, poet, uh, Turkish religious figure, um, which is really common still to this day, even though I think um, uh, things have changed recently. I mean, especially with the, you know, the new order, Islamist government being in power, you know, this has changed. Um, but, you know, still the, I'm, 
And of course, I think I understand, you know, a bit of this misconception that, you know, the fact that Rumi lived most of his life in Konya, um, a city in, the, in central Anatolia, um, maybe this kind of added to that misconception, but at the same time, I don't think this really explains the full scope of the issue. Um, and I guess one way, one of the ways I can possibly explain this, um, uh, this phenomenon uh, that, that Rumi, commonly known as Mevlana in Turkey, um, was Turkified um, as part of the nationalist um, agenda or the project in the early years of the, of the Turkish Republic and, and later. Um, so this pretty embarrassing anecdote is kind of my way into the topic um, I was asked to talk about today, uh, which is the traditions and the politics of Rumi translations in, in Turkish. Um, actually, um, Leonard, when you, know, when you asked me to speak today, I thought I was going to talk about the over-Islamization of Rumi um, in Turkey, which is um, in stark contrast with what happened to Rumi in the West, right? I mean, uh, Sarah already talked about that, um, namely the erasure of Islam or the Islamic references from Rumi's work um, uh, that he kind of turned into a new agey, you know, icon or kind of like, you know, sometimes he sounds like a Brooklyn hipster. Um, so, um, but then I realized that, you know, it's, I think to me, it's more important to talk about this nationalist project, uh, the Turkification of Rumi, um, that already took place, um, and also it, which preceded this over Islamization of, of Rumi. Um, so I'm not sure if you heard of, of Kemalism, uh, a prevailing ideology uh, of the country since the beginning of the, of the Republic. Um, um, well, I have to be very superficial and brief about this, you know, this, this ideology. I mean, I call it, you know, um, secular fascism. The Kemalists wouldn't call themselves that, you know, they, I think, consider themselves as, um, um, you know, progressive um, reformist group devoted to Western um, modernist lifestyle and so-called pro progressive politics. And they're also definitely devoted to Atatürk's uh, vision um, for the nation when he was building the nation in the 20s and 30s. Um, and another useful information, I think, is that Kemalists um, are still working really hard to, to separate the history of the land, um, most importantly, the Ottoman history, Ottoman past, from its current state. Um, so, well, you can guess, you know, they, Kemalists kind of failed in their mission to do so since, you know, the, the current Islamist government uh, for the past, you know, two decades. Um, has brought back the, the ghost of the empire and, and they now seem to be living in their new Ottoman dreamland. Um, so anyway, the, tension, the, the tensions between the Kemalists and the Islamists affected um, deeply the tradition of Rumi translations um, since you know, the beginning of 20th century. Um, and you know, one of the reformists or let's say modernist decrees that Atatürk um, implemented was the closure of, of religious institutions that were not um, governed by the state or the, the closure of the places of worship or religious um, gatherings, including the Dargahs, uh, uh, the gathering place for Sufis um, in, in Turkey. However, Rumi became uh, one of the secular figures um, that the newly founded Republic, Turkish Republic, used in their cultural propaganda um, to, um, how do you say this, to kind of build this image, image of a modern state uh, with a Western secular outlook. So Rumi was definitely part of that um, cultural uh, propaganda. Um, and then, you know, I guess this is what's you know, similar to what happened to Rumi in the West um, as he became to represent, you know, the good Islam, as, you know, Sarah already explained, Sufism, a more secular um, version of Islam, Islamic tradition um, versus bad Islam, pretty much everything else um, in the Islamic tradition. So I think this is very much the current um, state of Rumi translations. I mean, there's still this, you know, like, uh, and oh, and I have to acknowledge that you know Sarah made a great point about how this separation of mystical tradition of Islam from the legal uh, tradition that is that happened already in in, in the West kind of serves the Muslim um, 
especially Sunni Muslim uh, communities to, to, to you know, also remove Sufism from the Islamic tradition. Um, anyway, so this is just to give you a bit of historical and political background um, before I can talk about the, the Rumi translations. And you know, Rumi, basically, these transitions cannot be separated from the, the dominant politics of, of, of the time. Um, so um, there are mostly now, in my understanding and to my knowledge, um, there are two prominent versions of Rumi translations, the ones that done by the Islamists and the other um, others done by the Kemalists. Um, I mean, of course, there are other transitions their transition is done by other people who don't fit into these political camps, uh, but um, they're not many that I can speak of. Um, so um, one of the more modern translations of Rumi is done by um, Emel Levi, a Sufi um, scholar, poet called um, Tahir um, al-Meglevi. I think these translations were first um, became available in the early 20th century. Um, I only saw a copy, um, an edition from 1963, but I think they were available already um, at the turn of the century. Um, so um, this translation, I was told by, by some scholars of Rumi that um, they were used by others um, in the 40s and 50s um, for more modern translations of Rumi. Um, so um, the most commonly available Rumi translations actually came out of this um, Tercüme Birosu, um, Turkish translation office that was founded in 1940. And by like 1946, um, this office um, translated and published almost 500 books from world literature and among them was Rumi. Um, so the translator was Velet Izbuda, uh, but because someone more um, mm, famous, prominent, a better known figure, Abdul Baki um, revised or yeah, revised this edition, uh, Gölpinarle is often attributed as the translator, um, not the revisor. So the copy I have um, is by them and was published in 1957. But this copy doesn't have the introduction by Gölpınar uh, in which he talks about Rumi uh, within the Persian uh, literature, uh, part of the Persian literature, and as a, as a you know Farsi-speaking um, poet and, and theologian. So I'm not sure why this is the case exactly, but because the newer editions have this introduction, and which clearly states that Rumi uh, was a Persian um, poet and, and religious figure. So um, um, let me just go back to the translations again. So, you know, I, I mean, still, you know, even though the situation has changed, um, Rumi has been acknowledged as a Persian poet and theologian, still the common readers um, don't, um, don't have this uh, information yet. Um, and they still consider Rumi uh, Mevlana as, as, a, as a Turkish, um, Turkish poet. So now with the Islam is in power, there are more publications and translations by, uh, of Rumi by the religious um, right-wing scholars and translators. And yet this, you know, or Islamization of Rumi has already taken place um, by also yeah, removing some of the content um, in his work. And then that doesn't fit, with, fit into the Turkish state's official religion, which is the Sufi Islam, right? Um, and um, by also representing Rumi as a pious religious figure, but within really like, they're removing Rumi from the Sufi tradition in, in certain ways that is kind of problematic. Um, however, what I have recently found out that there's now a growing um, number of scholars and translators within the Islamic tradition and thought that, that who claim uh, that Rumi wasn't even a Muslim. He was actually a Mughal um, spy. Uh, that uh, you know, he helped uh, the Mughals to to uh, to assassinate some of the major um, Muslim leaders or figures of the time. So this is a conversation that I became aware of only recently. So I haven't done really thorough research yet. But I mean, it's interesting that you know there's now this um, this new approach to Rumi, which I wasn't aware of, that um, remove 
we moved Rumi entirely from the Islamic tradition, not only just Sufism, but like, you know, he wasn't even a Muslim, he was just a spy. And they're seriously talking about this right now, which is, I mean, maybe not surprising that I am a little shocked. Um, so anyway, um, you know, I guess I can just talk a bit more about this, you know, this new approach. Um, but before that, you know, I recently watched two eminent scholars on Sufism, on Islamic thought, and, and Rumi talking about uh, this, this new approach, um, this new line of thinking of Rumi. And so they were talking about the beginning of Masnavi, um, the introduction to Masnavi, um, that meant that said, you know, that that mentions like Rumi says, um, or whoever wrote this introduction, probably not Rumi, but you know, someone who was listening to Rumi, that Mesnevi came down to him directly from Alam Nirin Rabbi, which is one of the ways to name Allah, right? And then Mesnevi serves as a correction to Quran. Um, so this cannot be accommodated or accepted in this in the Sunni Islamic tradition, um, since you know the Sunni Islam dictates that Quran is the book of um, all religious books um, and sent not only to Muslims, but um, but everybody else and cannot be questioned because these are the direct words of Allah. But then Mesnevi claims to be a higher, more sacred uh, book than Quran. So like, you know, as you can imagine, this cannot be accommodated within the legal tradition of Islam, right? And so these scholars also talked about certain passages from the fifth book, at least in the Turkish translation, the fifth volume um, of Masnavi, which is the most controversial uh, for its homosexual content and the description of hell or other topics that don't fit into the Sufi Islam tradition or the legal tradition. So this, this volume was also at some point um, was censored in, in Turkey um, for it was labeled as obscene by the um, um, state censorship office, right? So Rumi has already gone through censorship, um, not once, actually, several times in Turkish. Um, so this the relatively new approach by the Islamist toward Rumi and his work, especially claimed that he wasn't even a Muslim, um, might have something to do with this, you know, with Mesnevi's claim to be a higher, more sacred book than Quran or the homosexual content um, to this day is still censored. Like, you know, when I was watching this TV program with the scholars talking about um, Mesnevi, Rumi, they couldn't even read these passages on, you know, live TV uh, because they knew that they would be punished for doing such a thing. Um, so just to sum up, you know, the tradition of Rumi translations in Turkey, like most other things, um, is, you know, is very closely linked to the dominant politics um, or the political leaning of the translator the editor and the publishers. And even the language used in these translations differ because of the politics of the person translating or the person who's publishing. You know, for example, a secular or non-religious person would translate Rumi with, with a more modern, with more, more modern Turkish that is more, you know, commonly used. Um, and then more, you know, an Islamist would translate the work um, almost in like with like Ottoman Turkish, you know, which is not easily understood by younger generations. Um, so this is, I, I guess I'm just gonna, I've said enough for now, so if not too much, I'm going to stop here and, and you know, we can talk about this later in the conversation. Thank you, Oiko, it was really uh, illuminating. I'll just say quickly, I, I had a grant which put me in Istanbul in 2019, specifically pertaining to Rumi, in order to, in my mind, in my imagination, or in my fantasy life, Rumi was the bridge figure between uh, um, believers and secular, secular Turks, because uh, what I said earlier, he's the quintessential liberal cosmopolitan, but he's also profoundly uh, a figure and profoundly uh, well, located in, in Muslim tradition. And what I discovered talking with secular Turks, the ones I spoke to, the writers and intellectuals I spoke to, they saw Rumi as part of the problem, as part of, as, as people who are uh, hostile to the kind of Islam that was taking over in Turkey, they saw Rumi as part of that, as opposed to liberating from that. So this give, helps at least me uh, with the, the larger background as to why people might have arrived at that position. Um, um, Gold, Hala's uh, translation 
of Rumi begins, if I may, Paolo, with uh, the following paragraph in the introduction. Uh, uh, Gafori writes, Rumi was a preacher before he was a poet. Born into a line of Islamic theologians, he was a celebrity delivering sermons to hordes of followers by the time he was 38. Eloquent and magnetic, dressed in a crown turban and silk robe, he evangelized in mosques and theological institutions throughout Konya. Disciples and admirers from Nishapur to Damascus to Mecca called him Molana, our master. So, Hala, of course, I'm, you know, ask uh, if your thoughts in, in response to, to Sarah and Oiku, but I'm just noting that your first, your opening paragraph locates um, uh, Rumi within um, Islam. Uh, but I do have a question about your first sentence. Rumi was a preacher before he was a poet. Does that mean he was a preacher and there was a before and after? He was a preacher, then he was a poet because he had a born again experience, so to speak, or yes, is that about continuity? Is that about continuity yeah. and foundation? Yeah, well, you know, I mean, one could argue, I think I mentioned this too the other day that one, one could say Rumi was born a poet. So perhaps saying he was a preacher before he was a poet has some level of truth to it on some level that's true on some level he was born a poet right but but yes we have we do not have any poetry from him um, from uh pre shams so he met shams at around the age of 38 and previous to that you know he was working in konya as i said in, in theological institutions in konya and as a as a teacher and a preacher and he had followed in his father's footsteps in his grandfather's footsteps and he was as i said very famous and shams came into his life a kind of scruffy vagabond who was a very well versed mystic and and very well versed in the quran and in, in Sufi tradition, but he was a kind of rebellious spirit and somebody who really wanted to get to the root of the root of the root of the tradition and mass, the mass Navi as Rumi would later write, he describes it as the root of the root of the root of religion. And, and Shams was Rumi's doorway to the sun, as he says, that's one of his quotes, doorway to the sun. It, he was his doorway to, um, to you, to this idea of union, to union, to a sort of um, real deep spiritual experience that he wasn't having in the uh, environment that he was in, in this spiritual and academic environment where there were people, you know, vying for, you know, higher levels on the hierarchical ladder. And, you know, there was a, there was a level of hypocrisy. Of course, that's everywhere. I mean, <laughs> That's everywhere. So he was just, you know, he was getting exhausted by that and uh, suspicious of fame. And so when Shams came into his life and um, guided him away, invited him away from that, Rumi went and that was a shock to everybody. And when Rumi was, you know, sitting at Shams's feet, as Shams would say, and then wanting Shams to be the teacher um, instead of himself, that was a shock to his disciples. They were very disappointed. They were like, why are we listening to this guy? What does this guy know? And um, uh, anyway, Rumi continued for a, about two years with Shams and did the practices, all kinds of practices, one of them being Sama, which is the whirling practice. Deep listening first. The first definition of Sama is deep listening. The second definition is the whirling dance, and they did both. And it was during the this time that Rumi really started to open up as a poet. Now, actually, the very first poems he wrote were the poems um, that he wrote once Shams had left the first time because he was essentially driven out of town by the jealous disciples. So Shams just up and left one day and Rumi didn't know where he was and was absolutely devastated. When he found out that he was in Damascus, he started writing poems, love poems, come back poems, you know, please come back. And those were the first poems that we know of. And then when Shams came back, the practice of Samma continued and got deeper and deeper. And then Rumi was whirling and writing poems as he was whirling. And then he didn't stop till his death, even on his deathbed, he was composing. So that's the before and after. And he didn't go back to preaching. So that's the before and after. 
So Shams was the was the one who was the catalyst for this revolution. Really interesting. I get the sense that for you that uh, for you in your Rumi, your vision of Rumi in the translations, there is a break. There is a before and an after. He doesn't go back to to preach. Although there is a quality of there is a uh, exhortation at least in the poems. There is a kind and, of and he, con and he continues practices. He continues his practices. He continues to fast. He continues to pray. He continues to do zek or dek zek, which is the practice of reciting the names of God. You know, so it wasn't like he rejected. Um, the spiritual tradition. He wasn't rejecting Islam. He wasn't rejecting, not by no means, you know, he was just not preaching anymore. Um, yeah. yeah. Um, Sarah, Oiko, any follow-up thoughts on what, um, oh, Sarah, any follow-ups on what Oiko or Hala just said? Well, I, I learned a lot about what's going on in modern Turkey, which I suppose I shouldn't be surprised by the, um, you know, the, the whole concept of official Sufism was one that was really striking for me when I visited Turkey last, which was a few years ago. I'm sure it's only gotten more profound, but there's a paradox to official state Sufism that perhaps was always, you know, sort of doomed to be unstable. And the fact that, um, I mean, I shudder to think what the Erdogan government is doing to the, to the to the translations and to the cutting and and you know the choosing of what gets admitted as state poetry and state Rumi and what doesn't. So, I just like to thank you for that. I'd love to learn more about it. Um, the, uh, our subtitle for today's discussion was the politics of ecstasy, and so we really are talking about the way in which Rumi is. Uh, constructed and for various political kinds of purposes, even as we keep our mind and eye on the poetry that Hall has laid before us, which uh, 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 which is a critique of all of that, which is a critique of the hierarchical and the way in which uh, power uh, usurps, uh, the politics of power usurps the, the, the power of love. So, uh, so it's really complicated and intriguing. Um, are there questions from, we have such a wonderful group of, of people here. I see Pierre Joris, a noted translation, important translator from of works from the Muslim world. We see Ruby Ferris, a graduate student at UMass who took the languages of unsaying a few years back. Anyone out there want to get into the conversation? You can uh, ask Anya to unmute you or just put a, a comment and a question or com, uh, question into the chat, uh, Pierre. If, if we could unmute Pierre on you, that would be mm -hmm. great. Yeah, Pierre, you should be able to turn. I am mic. unmuted now. <laughs> <Great>. <laughs> Hello, everybody. I'm very sorry I had to miss yesterday, but I would catch up on it when um, it is on, put online. Um, so I have spurned Rumi in English translations for most of my life. And so I'm really waiting to read the new one. My first question that came to me has to do with when I looked, I don't have the book yet, but when I looked at it online, it didn't tell me if it was bilingual. I have fear that it is monolingual. Uh, what is, uh, Halle, what, what it would? Yeah, it, it is. We didn't, we didn't put the Persian in there. Uh, we discussed it and then we came to the decision not to do it, you know. Um, we could have, love, we could have. Yeah, even if I don't know the language. Yeah. I think always it is important see to the, visually see the poem, how it looks on the page in the original, you know, the, the formal, because you can tell the formal elements from it. So, yes. Uh, try to convince them to put the out. Edition. Yeah, try Maybe to so. do that. I think that would be very so. useful. Mm -hmm. uh, but I hear, I like the language you're using. I, 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 I hear the. Uh, the poetry and uh, how to say not pietistic versions of Rumi, which is what we get so often. Uh, that whole question of the of Islam, the religiosity, the uh, and then the Sufi tradition with the digressions into uh, religious anathema, drunkenness in terms of Islam and so on. Uh, present both metaphorically and in life as uh, 
uh, Rumi makes clear in those, in those senses is very fascinating. I talked a bit about that whole question in the Conversations in the Mountains, a book of mine of interviews with Adonis, who uh, excoriates the monotheisms, uh, all three of them, of course, you know, and so, and uh, that the, the Sufi tradition he sees as, Europeans always think that modernism happens in the late 19th century with, um, Rimbaud and uh, Verlaine. And uh, he is clear that modernism happens with those Sufi poets in uh, the 10th century and around there in the Islamic world. And so uh, it has, they have been modern for nearly a, man, a millennium longer. And I can hear that in the translations. Mm. Good. Yeah. Yeah. I, I agree, they were very much ahead of their time on many levels. And, uh, you know, we, we, we named this, uh, or Leonard named this session, Rumi and the Politics of Delight. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when we think about the politics of delight, what are we talking about? We could talk about that phrase a bit, but I, I do think about the concept of emptiness, which is the, what the Buddhists speak of too, and this idea of befriending emptiness and how so much of the um, problem that humanity faces in through human history over and over and over and over and over again is of course the, the hoarding, the desire, the possession, the possessiveness and the desire for more and more power, the lust for dominion, the lust for power. And so this simple concept of, you know, befriending emptiness and not fearing this emptiness that is a part of existence and actually feeling, sensing the fullness then that emerges from it is I think very interesting and, and kind of a very um, important concept on a personal and political level. I agree, I agree. Can I add, can I add something to um, what Sarah spoke of earlier? Uh, she mentions um, uh, al, al halaj and you know that al halaj said, I am God. He said, Ana al haq Ana al meaning I am the truth. truth, which is one of the qualifications of God. And yeah. I think it makes it much more, although he got killed for it, it makes it, however, much more interesting uh, as a concept that he says, I am that part of whatever the divine is, that is the truth that speaks the truth and does not lie in that, in that sense. So, um... <laughs> Sarah, you want, you want to respond to that? Well, yeah, I mean, it's, it, it is, so the Sufis are the ones who came up with the concept of the 99 names of God, because in the Islamic tradition, of course, we can't see God, um, we can't depict God, so the only way we can know God is through his, dis his descriptions in the Quran. And so Al-Haq is one of those descriptions. It is, I mean, I just agree that it is interesting that, uh, you know, those are quite a few quotidian descriptions. I mean, it also the beautiful, the wise, the, you know, so those are all descriptions that could be applied to anyone. Um, so it is interesting that he was perceived to have been talking about a haq in the, in the God sense. Um, I did have a question for you. If I may, I would, uh, just I was intrigued by the, um, I'd love to pick up your interviews with Adonis, I'm wondering what he means by modernism, because it's just simply atheism for him, um, or his, con con I, well, I'll stop talking. I'm, I'm already objecting to him without, yeah. Mm -hmm. One is on the literary uh, tradition. Mm -hmm. It breaks the rules of classical Arabic poetry, mm -hmm. just as Rambo and so on break the rules of classical uh, Euro Western uh, poetics and poetry, and that breakage uh, breaks it off from a tradition that has in it certain notions, be it truth, God, uh, etc., and opens up the poetry to all those elements that come in, be it, you know, Rimbaud speaking, il faut toujours être libre, you always got to be drunk, to Rumi, you know, uh, speaking of all that. So the modernism 
okay. is both formally, poetically, and philosophically, I think, very clear, breaking loose from the rigid mm. tradition that those two different monotheisms have imposed on their cultures. Mm. Well, thank you. Sure. That gets me to think about monotheism in an interesting new way. Uh, not monotheism, sorry, modernism. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So yeah. yeah, so Adonis's atheism might be something different than his his argument about modernism being birthed mm -hmm. in 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 the Sufi tradition. You know, there are so many really intriguing questions floating around now in the in the discussion, but we also have only uh, a, a little bit of time left. And and although politics was in the description, poetry is still central. We I really do want to. Um, turn it back to Hala if she can if you can read us a, a poem or two more from from gold just out this week uh these really exciting new Rumi translations there's a lot we disagree probably in this panel and so on about uh about the politics of Rumi but I think we all agree this is really an important new translation so uh Hala could you um take us back into the poems for for, for a sure. few minutes um sure you wake the dead to life, you fountain of grace, you fire in thickets of tangled thought. Today you arrived beaming with laughter, that swinging key that unlocks prison doors. You are hope's beating heart, you are a doorway to the sun, you are the one I seek and the one who seeks me beginning and end. You greet need with generous hands. You flood us with spirit, rising from the heart, lifting thought. Rare one, you reveal the pleasure of wisdom and practice. Beyond these, what is there but excuses and deceit? We lust after the afterlife. We stew over trinkets. We stage battles between black and white, our ears plugged with twisted delusions. You carry the cure. Silence. I am in a hurry now. Leave the paper, break the pen. The cupbearer is here, jug in hand. Meet us in the land of insight, camped under ecstasy's flag. Thank you so much, Hala. Um, that's wonderful. But you know, uh, I also might have made a bit of a faux pas because there might be some more questions out there and comments from, um, uh, from the from everyone who's attending. Can, um, if Nick or, or yeah. Um, can, or Anya can inform me, help me with that. That would be great. We might ask you to read one more poem after that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we have a, a couple of, of questions in the chat. Um, uh, I can turn now to um, Ruby, who um, asked a question. Um, if you'd like to unmute. Yes, certainly my microphone has been faulty lately, so I'm sorry if any strange metallic noises happen, but I just wrote in the chat, I was so um, struck by the term state poetry as well as secular fascism, and I was wondering how um, through translation is Rumi being potentially stripped of sublimity or religious significance, like has the language of Rumi been altered via uh, translation to suit secular interests? Yes, I mean, that's what I meant, not the secular fascism part, but, you know, yeah, Rumi in more secular leaning translations. Um, I mean, it's really kind of similar to, let's say, like what Coleman Barks did with his translations, you know, there was no ref net reference, Islamic reference in those translations. Something similar happened in the Turkish translations. Um, by the um, the Kemalists or the you know modernizing secular group, um, and yeah, I mean you know or or censored you know certain parts of of the of his work were basically were not included, um, were removed from from the translations. So that's what I meant. Hey, Sarah. Sorry about that. 
Um, thank you for that question, Ruby. I, I feel torn about this because I think, and of course, all of you can speak to this better than, than I can, but I think there's a virtue to keeping poet, the poets and poetry away from governments, right? And, and away from that kind of uh, exploitation in a sense. But then when I put on my despairing 21st century Muslim hat and I, I look around and see um, kind of the versions of Islam that are being adopted by various governments and various societies for a bunch of political reasons, I would argue. And you see a country uh, like Turkey, which is actually putting um, Sufism really front and center as part of a very obvious kind of marketing campaign. But nonetheless, it's pretty unique in, in the Muslim majority world as really putting forward this version of Islam that you know I think is more generative of potentially, I have to be careful, more liberatory interpretations. Um, I also see the virtue in that. And I don't know if that is overly pragmatic on my part and really does do in the end long-term damage to the project of poetry, which I sort of read in your little bit of a, a little bit of an anxiety in your question there, um, potentially being stripped of sublimity. So just want to put that, that query out there. That's really, really complicated and interesting. Anya, I think though there are a couple of other questions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have a few more audience questions. Um, I'll turn now to Andrew. Um, you should be able to turn on your microphone if you're still there. Hi, Andrew. Hey, um, thanks for this. I, I enjoyed yesterday's session uh, as well. I just had a quick question. Um, I guess it's about, about the commercial aspect of Rumi. I grew up in a small hometown in Northwestern Pennsylvania. And I was never interested in reading Rumi because I would always see a volume of his work on the shelf with like the only other poetry that was available in my hometown, Khalil Gibran's The Prophet, Jonathan Livingston Seagull, uh, a selected frost that had um, stopping by woods on a snowy evening and on the back cover, and maybe some thematized Emily Dickinson or something. I'm just wondering about, you know, if you can say anything about what I'm assuming was a struggle in the States anyway, to um, to kind of secure Rumi or re-secure Rumi as a legitimate serious poet and not just as a kind of new agey figure, inspirational figure who just happened to write. I think that's a question for you, Hala, as the one who's re-secured Rumi. Well, hopefully so. You know, I, I do, I feel that he's, yes, I feel that in many cases um, are, our experience of Rumi is of, of a very sort of fluffy, lightweight poet, especially through the, you know, the online memes, the one-liners that you don't even know where they came from. A lot of times it's just people are writing their own sentence and putting Rumi under it, you know. But um, and and he's and he has been diluted in translations. We've lost a lot of the muscle, I think, of his you know, he's a very muscular poet in terms of there's, and there's a propulsive energy, there's leaping imagery, there's surprising images, and there's surprising movement between the images that I think sometimes is lost. And I, I mean, I hope that I've done my part to, to bring in a more precise Rumi and a, um, a Rumi that is, that is, uh, you know, just more complete really. And, you know, I've attempted to bring him into the music of American contemporary poetry. So that was my job. I hope that I have, that I've helped with your, you know, your desire and question to, to fill that gap, you know. Thank you, Hala. Thank you, Andrew, uh, for that, for that question. Uh, Anya? Yeah, our next question will be coming um, from our friend GE. You should turn on, be able to turn on your mic. Thank you so much. Thank you, Anya, so much. Um, can we say that Ruby finds in Islamic spirituality and, and, and mystic poetry a vehicle for the expression of the endless bounties of love? Uh, 
Yes, I do. <laughs> I would like to think so. <laughs> I do. <laughs> and I think, you know, it's poetry is, is, is a vehicle. Poetry is a means of really touching us sometimes somatically, you know, viscerally. We can, the, the, the poetic illogic and the images coming at us sometimes enable us to access these big concepts like this shoreless, boundless love in a way that just um, average conversation or you know conceptual uh, sort of discussions don't really let us in in the same way that poetry can. So I do think that yes, he he uses it as a vehicle for this exploration and mm -hmm, brings us closer to it. I also just want to quickly thank you for bringing a kind of wonderful, great physicality to the aspect of the body on, and, and his body into the work, which I really appreciate. And thank you. Yes, yes, yes. I completely agree with you, uh, GE. No relation, so I don't, it's not a, it's not like we're uh, <laughs> in on it together, but I completely agree with you uh, no on that, that physicality and that embodied quality of, 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 uh, Alez Rumi. So Anya, um, our other questions, please, Anya. Yeah, we have, we have one more question if we have time. Um, you should be able to turn on your microphone, Claire Voyage. Oh, thanks. Oh, you've muted, I think. We lost you. We lost not uh, image and- uh, And audio. Right. Right. He's shy. Oh, no. It's time to ask the question and then he disappeared. <laughs> Their voyage. Oh, no. oh, you're back. Oh, you're gone again. Okay. One more moment. We can see you, but we can't hear. Now we can't hear you or see you. Oh. Claire Voyage. That's a tease of a name. <laughs> What's going on here? Well, maybe. Oh, maybe. Yeah. What were you going to say, Hala? No, I just said we can't. Yeah, he just came yeah. out. We can't. Perhaps. Hear. Perhaps you can send your question. Um, to the Brooklyn Rail and we can pass it along um, to Hala. Claire for the Voyage future. was here yesterday too. Yeah, I'm yeah. so sorry about this. I'm so sorry about that. Yeah. No, just um, Claire, Claire Voyage, all you have to do is touch your unmute button. <laughs> Don't touch your camera button, your unmute button. You're muted. You're muted. Uh, your lips are moving. I can I can't hear that. you. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Oh, wait, it's, one oh, moment. Oh, wait, no, it's working. We it was saying that okay. working. Not there we go. Go for it, Claire. I was clicking it before. I got you. So, yeah. All right. So that's the band name. I'm sorry. I'm trying to be pretentious with the name. Um, Good but, name. Uh, yeah, so it's not a very concrete question, but it, I want to hear people's responses and what this brings up. Uh, so I get the sense that Rumi, well, yeah, he's, he's creating in the moment he's speaking uh you know he's whirling you know that's his like process it's it's not so dry it's not even necessarily a passive like i'm waiting for the best word and it comes to me maybe sometimes but it sounds quite like he's taking that leap that he talks about in the moment of the creation so it sounds very bold and then what comes to mind too in this conversation this discourse is how so much talk of like you know like uh like law comes up for example like so this idea of like okay on the one hand is there some filter you know like is there some type of like yeah i think you guys get it like on the one this spectrum like on one hand it's kind of like more reflective thing even before the thoughts come or when you're you're in the moment of the poem and like how far do you think he jumps out of that filter you think he jumps entirely out of the filter to where he might say something that is like not okay in his culture and he he just dares and goes that far and then oh it's okay, it actually lines up and it's okay. Or do you think that he doesn't go totally 100% into, I don't know what's gonna happen, I'm totally, and because he's aware that he's in a cultural context. So I'm curious what, you know, the responses to this type of, I don't know, angle, if you wanna call it that. Yeah. How strategic is Rumi or is, is all strategy ab uh, abandoned uh, right. in, and, and, in and ecstasy? And is it even possible to be strategic and calculating while you're whirling? I think, I think right. probably no. I think that, <laughs> that the whole idea of that practice of it's deep listening and you know this incredibly challenging, you know, as far as motor coordination goes, like an in incredibly challenging practice. I mean, if you, you try whirling in your house, you'll 
get dizzy and fall over. I mean, it's not easy. It requires an incredible amount of concentration. And he says, you know, um, Samma takes you, uh, or the, the um, what does he say? The ladder leads to the seventh heaven, Samma's ladder reaches higher. You know, so something is happening to him. And he says, it's the food of lovers. Something is happening to him in this space where he is, he has departed you know, any sort of sense of calculation, strategy, reason, logic has, has abandoned the premises, you know, and he is uh, in some other state, I think, when he says at the end of the poem, um, in a field of logic, my, my, uh, my horse of words has no room to run beyond reason, the voice of my soul soars. So I think the voice of his soul is soaring in the midst of Samma. And he was lucky to find a practice that put him into that state. You know, I think that many writers can ask themselves, you know, what is, what is my practice that is going to get me into that state of mind, um, into the, the poetic territory, which is, which is, which is, which is of leaps and bounds and 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 devoid of a sense of narrative often or logical narrative so um yeah i don't know i hope that somewhat answers the question yeah i would say that yeah. rather oh. than being constrained by the culture he expanded the culture you know he was the the, the agent yeah that's really exciting to think of Rumi as a, as a cultural worker mm -hmm. uh, as Gramsci puts in a cultural worker expanding well, the culture, yeah. Um, in the field of logic, my horse has no place to run. Allah translates Rumi and giving the horse a place to run, right? Giving the horse. Yeah, a field of logic, my my horse has no no room to run. Yes, mm -hmm. room, I, to run. room to run. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, thanks, thanks. That uh, that makes you know, That's what I thought and hoped, and uh, I'm glad to hear you know what everyone shared. Yeah, I, yeah. I think he was always pushing the boundaries. No doubt about it. No doubt. Mm -hmm. I, I know we're getting, uh, it's a, we've gone over a little bit, but can we end with one last poem, Ale? Sure. Um, how about uh, we go ahead and since we're talking about whirling, we do one that mentions whirling. And, you know, the form is Ghazal. So in this particular translation, you hear the repeating refrain at the end. The word is Berachsa, Berachsa. Oh, Berachsa, it means dance, dance, dance. So here's the poem. The spring of souls is here fresh branch budding branch come and dance and you dear lion so fierce and hot tempered come and dance you surrendered your head and feet headless and footless come and dance and you rare king true king nourishing as mother's milk come and dance a man arrived with sword in hand and venom on his tongue. Evil dwells here, he says, and so does good, my friend, come and dance. Lovers whirl in devotion, ecstasy their crown. Where they are, what use is the royal cloak? Beautiful one, dressed to serve, come and dance. You who are drunk on self, union is your destiny, the map is in your hand, taste the rapture now, come and dance. If you're my beloved bearing a cup of wine, if you're a branch bearing no fruit, come and dance. The peacock, oh, the war is over, the band is singing, come and dance. Unfurling its dazzling wings, the peacock calls to the bird of the soul. You, without wing and feather, come and dance. Ale, thank you so much. It's really wonderful, wonderful to hear these poems and the book just emerging this week. Mm -hmm. Let me turn things over to Anya and Nick and, and Fong too, because the Brooklyn Rail has these wonderful closing traditions. <laughs> thank you so much, Leonard. Um, and thank you to Oiku, to Hala, to Sarah, to everyone who asked questions today. I'm really glad we got to all of them um, and heard all of your wonderful thoughts um, and presentations. And we also would like to thank Abigail and everyone at the New York Review of Books for helping to make 
today's event possible. Um, we encourage everyone to view our archive of these conversations on our YouTube channel, where this will be uploaded very shortly, as well as yesterday's event. And you can join us tomorrow at 1 p.m. for a conversation with Turquoise Dyson, Matthew Sims, Alex Bacon, and Phyllis Tuckman on the event of Ad Reinhardt, Color Out of Darkness, curated by J James Terrell at Pace Gallery. We'll conclude with a poetry reading by Mark Wallace. Um, and now I'd uh, like to welcome everyone to turn on their microphones um, and say thank you and goodbye. Mm -hmm. Thank you all so very much um, for this event today. Thank you. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you Hala. Hey, program. Thank you, Leonard. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you, Lena. Bravo, bravo. Thank you, Anya. Thank you, Lena. Thank you, Anya. Thank you, 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 Hi, Julie. Hi. 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 Oh, she's here. Hi, <laughs> Julie. Hi, Julie. Hi, Julie. Hi, Julie. Hi, Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye -bye. I think. Salah, Ali, Elton, Howie, very nice. <laughs> nice to sort of meet you. <laughs> Congratulations again, Hala. Thank Congrats. you. Thank you so much. Really, Hala. I can't wait to read Hala, everything. Hala, yesterday you recited in your translation this line, today is an invitation to ecstasy. I just want to change that line a little bit and say, you know, your voice is an invitation oh. to ecstasy. I am <laughs> so proud of hey. you. reciting and singing. Rumi, I am yeah, singing. I, I'm, on, I'm high on life. Thank you. <laughs> That's what I've been yeah. saying every time You're I meet joy. Bob. You're a joy. <laughs> You're a joy. I look forward to getting here to New York City. We're going to see you soon. Yeah, hopefully. hopefully. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, now we're all high. Yeah. <laughs> yes. That's what I'm saying. Every time I've met Hollis since 2018, I've been high on Rumi. Uh, I'm, I'm Hollis' voice. Not to yes. say anything, uh, uh, not to give it all to Rumi. There's definitely Hollis. <laughs> I and Rumi. That's that's a good that's reminder. Good news. That's good news. <laughs> Hola, Hola. One parting thought. You sung beautifully the original version. Why don't you think the English version too do what French Jerome Rothenberg called the total translation? Called the what? The a total translation. Oh, the total okay. translation, right? You so know, where you would the also English sing, and the music. sing perform. Interesting. Yeah, think of that for the uh, opening here in New York. Yeah, perhaps at the book launch, I'll do a little of that. You know, yeah, I'll experiment with a little of that. Yeah, you've, you've done that with Hafez, Hala. Yeah. You've I've heard you sing Hafez. I sing Hafez, but I do. But he's saying, why not sing it in English? Sing English. The translation. I understand. Right, I understand. Yeah, which I rarely. Yeah, I mean, I never do that. I just sing the Persian and then recite the English, but. It's it's there's one line that I like to say. He says, "My soul, you are my true eyes." I like to sing that line. "My soul, you are my true eyes." <laughs> that's a nice. That's the only line I've sung. So try some more. <laughs> I'll try some more. Thanks to you here. I will. <laughs> all right. Ciao. 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 Good morning. Thank about you that. all. Good morning on the sixteenth. Anyone who's in town. Yeah, March 16th. Yes. Right. And and Clifford, Clifford, um, uh, uh, John Cascarelli uh, introduced me to you by email. Oh, yes. Oh. And you're in Turkey, right? right. Yeah, I yeah. know. So. This very yeah. minute. Yes, yes. And he told me of a possible festival in June. Well, let us dream on. Let us dream on. <laughs> that's, that's, that was the last I heard, is like, hopefully. We'll see. <laughs> yeah, but no, it would be lovely to see you here anytime. Yeah, well, we'll, we'll, see. we'll see. Hands out, yeah. Great, As I love speaking, it. I love Cliff, it. Um, I didn't know you already invited Hale to Turkey. Well, John was speaking of it. John was speaking of a, of a festival, and, and so we'll see. It's, it's you know, it's, it hasn't happened. Yeah, yeah. 
No, no, no. I'm a, I'm aware of the whole thing. And I, I might be part of that too. So yes. oh, <laughs> that's what I'm saying. That's great. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. I hope it happens. We'll see. We'll make it happen. <laughs> yes. Absolutely. It would be fabulous. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. I love the translations. It would be wonderful to hear them here, you know, in the Troad, above the Aegean, you know, oh. in the mountains. <laughs> okay. All right. All the I'm best. there. I'm there. <laughs> Say the word. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you all again. Thank Bye. you. Thank you so Thanks. much. Thanks. Thank you, Thank you, everyone. Thanks. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye